down. He looked in the bulletin this morning and said, the name of the title of the sermon is Time to Do. And he said, he wanted to go get his steel toe boots. <laughs> I want to talk about action, attention, and a danger this morning after I go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, as we come to you, we do realize that you are holy. And as we sing that hymn, holy, 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 I can see the angels bowing down before you and ascribing holiness to you, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And this morning, Father, we are so aware that our Lord Jesus is with us, having made the promise where two or three are gathered in his name. I can feel his presence around me, and I know that the others here can too. And it's encouraging and strengthening to us to know that our Savior is that close at all times. So, Father, I pray that you're working in every heart this morning. Give peace where peace is due, but sometimes we don't need peace. We need you to give us something else. You need to help us to understand we need to change and give us no peace until we come to you. So, Father, have your way this morning in every life here. And every life will be listening to this message over CDs or Internet. Father, please work in those lives, for time is short. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this time this morning. And we pray as always in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Why are Christian witnesses so weak today? Have you ever wondered why that is? Well, I think the answer comes right away in verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know, people are always looking around. Yeah, wow. But they're not doing what God says. They're doing mostly what they want to do. And so since they want to do what they want to do, they want to change the word of God. Well, if I could just change the Word of God, then I'm not guilty of anything. You know, hardly a month goes by that I don't get an email or some snail mail about a new version of the Bible. You know, most of these are produced by special interest groups which have an agenda, and that's to promote, promote their false belief system. And most of them are blasphemous, I'm going to tell you right now. There are neuter gender versions which try to be politically correct and picture God as neuter or as female. There are homosexual friendly versions and other wicked versions that attempt to water down sins. That's what they want. You'd be doers of the word if we change the word. Well, and you can't change the word, but it doesn't stop what God is saying. Sin is sin. There are many different translations of the Bible out there today. And I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of them are straight from the pit of hell. There's no other way to say it. When you change the Word of God, you're in trouble. You say, I believe that in Revelation, it, that curse does not only just apply to the gospel, to the prophecy of Revelation, but to the Bible. Don't change the Word of God. Don't water it down. Don't change it. But you know, we actually do need a new version of the Bible. We really do. Well, that opened a few eyes when I said we need a new version. And I'm talking about a translation that's different from Tyndale's translation. From the authorized version. And all the new trans we need something different. You know, the fact is that every born-again believer can make this new translation, this new version. Every believer can. Now, I know you're thinking, so, well, I don't know the original languages. I don't know how to handle manuscripts. Well, regardless of your limitations, and I know there are a lot. And you have a number of limitations, so do I. But we can still make the best translation, the best version of the Bible that's ever been out there. Do you know what I would name this version of the Bible? The doer's version. That's right. Be ye doers of the word. That would be a truly wonderful translation. You know, Paul said, ye are our epistle written in your hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but in fleshy tablets of your heart. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Most of the world today is not reading the Bible. 
they will not open it. You go in the house, they'll have a big Bible on the coffee table, but it's never opened. I guarantee you, if you open that Bible, 90% of the time, the spine's going to crack. People are not reading their Bibles. But people are watching you. People watch you. You're the version that people see. You're the version that people are going to read. Well, what is your version? You know, we got to re realize the fact that we are the only version of the Bible that a great number of people may ever see. Someone expressed it kind of poetically like this. The gospel is written a chapter a day by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men may read what you say, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? That's the version we need out there today. We need to be doers. You know, we get into trouble when we tend to be hearers only. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of hearers out there. I know I'm all windy. You don't have to tell me that. In the end, you tell the visitors on Wednesday nights, and, well, you know, he, he only talked an hour and five minutes on one verse. Yes, I'm long winded. I understand that. But I don't care. The Word of God needs to be spoken. The Word of God needs to be preached. But you know, sometimes when you hear the words, your thoughts are somewhere else. Many times you're thinking about other things than the Word of God. You're thinking about, well, will I be able to get to the restaurant before everyone else? Or what time does the ball game start this afternoon? And your mind wanders. The words are out there. You hear them, but you're not going to do them. Other times you hear exactly what's being said, but that's as far as it goes. You hear it only. Reminds me of the commercial I've mentioned many times. Don't leave it to Beaver. So Beaver, here's the lesson. It goes in this ear, rattles around a little bit, comes out over here. That's what happens a lot of times in church. You hear it, it doesn't stay and goes on. You know, you're ignoring the demands of God when you don't put into action what we're told to do. And that's what we're told. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, the Bible is different. It's a unique book from any book that's ever been written in the history of the world. And there are a lot of books you can read to gain information and knowledge and intellectual stimulation and amusement and entertainment. The list goes on. All these books you can read. But the Word of God is different. And it's that difference in the Word of God that keeps it from being popular with people. The difference is the Bible demands action. Be ye doers of the Word. It demands you do something. People don't like that. It demands action of me. It demands action of you and every believer. It also requires attention. Jesus said in John 7, 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And here's the action from Psalm 34, 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you read the Bible, there's a command over and over to do something, to get busy. You know, I enjoy history. I, hit, I read a history book. It makes no demands of me. Maybe you enjoy reading literature, and that's fine. But you know what? It, it, there are no imperatives, no declarations, no explanations in that. You can read science, but there's no demands on you whatsoever. You know, you can read a cookbook. But it may give you a recipe, but it doesn't demand that you go in the kitchen and bake some biscuits or a chocolate cake. No demands are given. But the Word of God is a command. It is a trumpet sound. It is an appeal for action. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Action. He that believeth not on the Son seeth not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Action here. Believe. No action. You're in deep, deep trouble, aren't you? No action. You don't believe. You know, the, the Bible demands that action. Like the message of Jesus Christ, one, repent, come unto me, believe. You see, that's what he, he's doing, demanding action. It demands belief. It demands action. You know, how advertising today is high pressure, isn't it? You know, it used to be, oh, when I was growing up, you had a minute. You had a TV show as a minute. You, know, you could all you could time yourself, a minute of commercial. Now you have more commercial than TV. 
And it's high pressure. And it's on radio, it's on TV, it's on billboards, newspaper, magazines. You know, if they took the advertisements out of most magazines to start like this, it would be like this. It's high pressure and people are being brainwashed by advertisers who are throwing everything possible at you. You know, car commercials tell you how much better this year's model was than last year, and the only difference is the price and the serial number. That's it. But the Bible, the very Word of God, you want to talk about hard sale? It is hard sale. The Bible says if you die in your sins without Jesus Christ, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. That's hard sale. That is truth, isn't it? Now, you talk about high pressure. Christian, that is high pressure. The Word of God says, Behold, now is the accepted time. And lay it over and back in Psalm 95, 7. Today, if you will hear His voice. You know, I believe the greatest failure of the church in the last 50 years or so is not the hard sale of now is the accepted time and today is the day of salvation. You know, we've We've had far too many flowery, feel-good messages being preached from the pulpits all over the world today. Too much time is spent on entertainment and not enough on preaching about the blood brought salvation of Jesus Christ. We have gotten away from the hard sell to be politically correct and to entertain. We can't do that. <clears throat> There's so much emphasis today <clears throat> excuse me, on filling the pews so we can fill the offering plate that people, they're not winning people to Christ. Too much, you know, too much worldly stuff. Man, you know, Wednesday night, I said, when I got that message, and 500 people have been saved. You know, if I had a choice of having 500 people in this congregation or 500 people being saved down in, in Ecuador, I'll take the 500 people being saved. That's what's important. We've missed that. The demands of Scripture are to be proclaimed loud and clear for all to hear. It must be preached with urgency. You see, we're close. Time is short. Life is short. And the Lord could come back for us today. Or He may call you home today. Life is short. I mean, every day, <clears throat> young people die. You know, when I was young, I never thought about death. No one thought about death. And when well, you're 18, 19, 20, you're invincible, you think. But you've got in a heartbeat. You need Christ. And that's what's being failed to be preached today. <clears throat> At the end of World War II, church attendance, church membership soared to new heights in this country. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Full churches, <clears throat> memberships growing. But you know, in spite of all that, lawlessness increased, immorality increased dramatically, including drunkenness and divorce and juvenile delinquency, and the country moved from conservatism to liberalism. What happened? If the churches are full and membership is growing, why did that happen? What happened in the lives of Christians was a total breakdown in separation from the things of the world. <clears throat> what was the cause? What was the cause? The church began giving out the gospel of Jesus Christ or the word of God in the passive voice. Well, what's wrong with that, Pastor? Well, the problem is God originally gave his word in the imperative mood. It demands something. It commands action. You can't be wishy-washy. Over the past years, between the ear-tickling and prosperity sermons, we have forgotten that that leather-bound Bible needs some shoe leather to go with it. We have to do something. The Bible demands action. And it demands it from you, and it demands it from me. Memorizing Scripture is good. As I get older, it's harder for me. I cannot... I have a hard time remembering addresses now. What, now, what chapter and verse was that? You used to be able to do that when I was young. Can't do that anymore. It's wonderful to remember, but it demands action. 
Here's the demand. Be ye doers of the word. There's an action required of every single believer. Now the Greek word that James uses here for the verb be is not the normal verb be here in the Greek. It literally means here to become, to be born, to come into existence. Born again believers are to become doers of the word. Born again believers are to come into existence as doers of the word. It's more imperative, isn't it? That's what he's saying. It's a demand of the born-again believer to do something, get, get the word out today. But did you ever notice that God makes demands of his own children, but he asks nothing of those who are not, except one thing. And the one thing that he asks is the thing they're not doing. Believe. You know, anyone who came to the Lord Jesus Christ, as he did in John 6, 28, and asked, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus replied like this, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He hath sent. For the lost believer doing, as far as God is concerned, is believing on Christ. That's the only thing. That's the only thing He asks. But He demands of His children. You know, God... Wants this rather than demanding of the unsaved person, he doesn't demand them to do something, but he tells them what he has already done for them. He tells them about Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ. You know, when I was a boy, I played baseball every opportunity. If you saw me going down the street, I had a bat and a ball and a glove. It didn't make any difference. I started playing on an organized team when I was eight, nine years old. And if there was an empty field, I was going to be there. By the time I left the house and got to the field, I had enough kids to play all day. One day I looked up over from that field, and here comes Dad. And I knew he wasn't coming to watch a ball game because he didn't like sports. Fact is, I left the house early before I cut the grass. But you know, when he came there, he didn't ask any of those other boys to do one single thing. He came to me and told me to go cut the grass. See, those other boys weren't his sons. They weren't part of his family. But I was. You see, God isn't asking anything from you until you become one of His children. And when you become one of His children, He says, be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. At times it's difficult even for preachers to remember that we have to be doers of the Word. And again, just someone wrote a little poem that was authors anonymous, but it says it's easier to preach than to practice. It's easier to say than to do. Most sermons are heard by many, but taken to heart by few. I tell you, these fellows must have said in some churches over the years they wrote these poems. When a child of God hears the word of God, it should lead to doing. It should lead to action. Being a hearer of the word will not lead to repetition and ritual and habitual action. It's not going to lead to the mundane, monotonous routine. It is the intent of the word to produce creative action and make a, a productive performance, an exciting life, a thrilling experience. That's for the believer. You know, if you're motivated by that inner desire, enjoying a, a spirit-filled life, then you can go out and you can play golf or you can hike a mountain or whatever you enjoy doing and then you can enjoy Bible study just as much or more and you're going to find out that when you study the Bible and enjoy it, it becomes thrilling to you. You see, life, the Lord doesn't want you to not have a, a joyful life. He does. We have to be careful what we do, but He wants you to enjoy life. A believer has more reason to rejoice and celebrate than anyone on earth. This is not, I know we're just passing through, we're heading to heaven, we have the Lord. But hearing the word will lead you to do for God. And that's motivated by inner desire. It comes from the heart. I've said many times, what's in the heart is going to come out of your life. Nearly 15 years ago, I came here to Mont Valley, you know anybody? Didn't know a soul. It was small. But you know, each, each person here had individual ministry, and over the years, they've all made marvelous contributions. But we, you know, we're small, we have loving, dedicated workers, and it's their love for the Lord, it's their love for the Word 
that produced action in their lives. You can tell when someone does something for the Lord, it gets done and they never say a word. They don't go, hallelujah, look at me. It's, they do it for the Lord. That's the action that the Bible calls for. Be you doers of the Word. People are not, these people here are not just hearers. They put it into action, they're doers. You know in colleges, even seminaries, there are people who simply sit in classes and audit that class. The professor one time said he had more trouble with auditors than he did with students. The auditors would say, you're too difficult on the students, you're too hard on them. But see, the, they didn't understand, those auditors didn't understand that the professors have to be hard because they want their students to learn. You see, those auditors never had to take an exam, never had to make preparations, never wrote a paper, never got a diploma. They didn't have to do anything. No action was required of them, they just had to sit in here. You know, it's sad that there are so many Christians sitting in pews this morning who are simply auditing the message sent from God. They're hearing it, but they don't take any responsibility. Man, I don't have anything else to do here. Faith leads to action. It will make you more than an auditor. It will make you more than an observer. And if you said that, but you just audit it. There's nothing. Just observe. You need to hear and listen and put it to, to good use. There's a story about a fellow years ago. He always talked about his faith. But he never did anything for anyone. He never did anything for the Lord, but he talked about his faith. One day he was out pulling his wagon, got stuck in the mud. One of his friends came by and said, Well, I see you're well established in the faith. You see, that's what happens sometimes. You know, as believers, we need to keep moving. Not just be here. We have to keep moving. We can't get stuck in the mud. When you talk the talk and don't walk the walk, you're stuck in the mud. Just like that fellow. So it's easy to be deceiving your own selves. Self-deception deception is pretty ugly. It's an awful thing because we don't see what God really wants us to see. The Apostle John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, in 1 John 1 a. And you know what? I've met people that have told me, well, I don't sin anymore. Well, unless you're, unless you're with the Lord, you're going to sin. That's what the Bible says. And people make up excuses for things. It's easy to, to fall into the trap of rationalizing your sins. It usually comes in the form of, well, I'm not as bad as that fellow over there, or the person over here. You're only deceiving yourself. Sin is sin, and your sin is just as bad as everybody else's. God does not have a scale where He weighs one sin against another. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, sometimes it comes in the form of works. Some people work around the church, but they're not working for the Lord. They're working for themselves. They do things, and then they do everything but take out an ad in the paper to tell you what they did. You know, that's, you know, they're looking for confidence. They're looking for the pat on the back. They're deceiving themselves that they're, really, they're working for the Lord. That this is a deception. They're working for themselves. It's selfish and prideful. When you deceive yourself, it's so easy for you to fall deeper and deeper into sin. You know, we, we see the danger of the Word here. It says, for if any man be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. In James' day, a mirror was a very highly polished piece of brass. There's no mirror, is it? It's a very interesting thing. And here it's used to picture the Word of God. Every single time that you look into a mirror, you see the reflection of yourself, and it's remarkable because that mirror shows you just the way you are. You know that you've never seen your own face. Praise the Lord for that. But I've never seen my, I've seen a reflection, but I've never seen my own face. But when I see that reflection, it shows exactly what's there. Perhaps you've noticed some, some of the portraits of Abraham Lincoln. You know, some portraits have some mold, some he doesn't. And there was a story about that, that the artist who painted him one time, he went in and he, 
He said, Mr. President, sit here and I move over here. When he got him where he wanted him, he put his easel down and he looked over and Lincoln was smiling. You see, Lincoln knew what he was doing. He was trying to move him where the mold wouldn't shine. And then the artist said, well, how do you want me to paint you, Mr. Lincoln? And he said, just as I am, mold and all. You see, that's what happens when we look in a mirror. If there's a mold there, we're going to see it. If there's a warp, we're going to see it. The Word of God is a mirror. And it's going to tell you exactly what you are. If you look into the Bible, it's going to show you who you are. Absolutely. It's like, I, and if you get, you know, I've heard people say from this verse, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face in the natural glass. We would say, I ought to be a woman. I would say, a woman beholding her face in the glass. Well, I know women carry pocket mirrors and things, but men are vain too. He wants a man. Man looks in the mirror. He wants to make sure his tie is straight and his hair is combed and all that stuff. Without a doubt, men are just as vain. You know, vanity, vanity, everything's vanity. Remember when you were little or younger, teenager, would you run out of the house to every every hair was in place and dressed in the latest fashion? Yes. As we get older, we're not quite as vain. But we still look. But see, the mirror reflects all our faults. All of them. The Bible is designed to do that. And it shows us every one of our flaws. There's a danger, though, of looking into a mirror and seeing that flaw and doing nothing about it. We tend to turn blind eyes to our flaws, to our mistakes, to our sins. Oh, yeah. <coughs> For he beholdeth himself and go away, go with his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. You know what John James is doing here in verse 24? He's basically answering what he said back in verse 19 when he said, Be swift to hear, slow to speak. The emphasis here is don't be too quick or too hasty when you look in the mirror. When you open the Bible and you look into it, don't be hasty. Take a good long look at what it says. The thought of being swift to hear. That is, give all of your attention to the Word of God. To be attentive to the Word of God. Don't treat the Word of God casually. Don't go over the Bible hurriedly. Don't do that. If any person is just a hearer of the Word and not a doer, his knowledge of the Bible doesn't lead him to any action. He's like a man beholding his face in the mirror and then straightway leaves and forgets what manner of person he is. If the Bible doesn't tell you something, you forget about who you really are. You know, the Bible, if you go from Genesis to Revelation, it shows man as he is. It doesn't cover it. It doesn't tell us, oh, how wonderful man is. He points us to the fact that we're sinners. And every one of us are in the same boat. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. So anyone who doesn't read their Bible, the fact is they will simply pass over the sections that offend them. Well, I read my Bible, but I didn't like that section. You know, so many people don't want to read Exodus chapter 20. There are too many thou shalt nots that we are doing. I don't want that. You know, being a doer of the Word means do what the Bible says, not what you want. It used to be a billboard. I don't know, I haven't seen it for a long time. And the question was, what part of that shall not do you not understand? We are some, that's the kind of people we are. What do we understand about thou shalt not? You know, you know people like to pass over sections and there's so many flowery sermons today, and I think that's one of the reasons textual preaching is a little outmoded. I feel strong that you need to go through the entire Word of God. I mean, go through it from Genesis to Revelation, and then start over again. I like to teach Bible studies, chapter 1, verse 1, go through. I like to preach through the whole book. It keeps it together, and you get the whole Word of God. Not, you know, not just pull out some nice, sweet verses here and there. 
There are beautiful verses in the Bible, and we'll get to them. But you have to preach the entire word because there's far too much ear tickling going on today. People are afraid that you're going to offend somebody. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. If you're offended, that's great because that means the word is hitting close to home. One thing that adds to the pulling out of verse here and there is the man-made addition of chapter and verses. You know, they were added so they'd help us to find portions in Scripture. I don't always agree with where a chapter or a verse ends, but it helps us to find things. You know, they were man-made. God did not inspire His Word to be written. Okay, Moses, you write Genesis chapter 1, 1, stop there, all right? And they didn't do that. That's one thought. But it's easier for us. But we need to take the Word of God, all of the Word of God. It's so easy to go into, well, I'm going to chapter so-and-so, and I'm going to pick out, oh, I like this one word, because I can build a whole theology around one word. You can't do that. You can't take one word or one verse. How does it apply to that chapter, to that book, and to the entire Bible? Genesis to Revelation. The complete revelation of God. We need that. We need to take the Word of God as it is the entire Word. The Bible is a mirror, and it reveals what's wrong with you, and it reveals what's wrong with me. You know, if you go to the dentist, and he takes an x-ray, and he finds a cavity, and you respond to him by saying, well, you know, I don't believe in x-rays, doctor. I, I, I don't think there's anything to it. I, I'm just going to ignore it and forget it. Well, you can do that. You can get up out of that chair and go on back, but before long, you're going to be in pain and gumming your food. That's the way it is. Most people, when they're told that they have a cavity, they want to get it taken care of right away. My point is that you can't afford to read the Bible and not respond to it. It is like an x-ray. It goes and it shows what's wrong with you. You need to respond. It demands your response and action. Here's another fact. If you don't respond to the Word of God, if you don't put it into action, you're responsible. You're responsible. No one else. If the doctor tells you have, you have cancer and you don't do anything about it, is the doctor responsible? Absolutely not. You are. God has given us His Word and you and you alone are responsible for it. What you do with it. He says, here is your problem. Here's the solution. Do something with the Word of God. The born-again believer the Bible might say to you, look, you're no longer growing. You've actually left your first love. You see, God using the Word of God, His Word, to remind you to come to Him. Come back. You're still saved. If you were saved, you're saved. Come back. Come back to that fellowship. How many times over the years, including this morning, have we sung, Standing on the Promises, but even though we were standing, singing, standing on the promises, the trouble is, many times we're only sitting on the premises. We don't trust God enough. Why? Because we don't look at the Word enough. Have you ever wondered why there are so many miracles recorded for us in Scripture? So many that a lot of times we miss the fact that they're miracles. Because God wants us to know He's in the miracle business and He performs miracles today. Well, no, nobody's parting the Red Sea today. But if it was something that God needed to be done, folks, that Red Sea would part. You sitting here this morning is a miracle. The fact that you made it from your house down 460 is a miracle. I want you to overlook these things. I've said many times, I should have been dead. I don't know how many times humanly thinking, but here I am. I'm a walking miracle. You know, James is telling us not to stand on, sit on the premises, but stand on the promises. The Bible is a mirror and it, it reveals our shortcomings and we're not to forget what it says. I know we get older, we tend to forget more and more. I do. I write a note, forget what the note's for. But we must, that's the reason we must continue to study the Bible more and more and more. You know, by the time we, we study from Genesis to Revelation, and you go back to Genesis again, it's all new. There's so many new things. 
The Holy Spirit brings out something He didn't show you before. You have to continually study. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the sunder, dividing the sunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and matters and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God reveals us as we are. It pierces below the surface of our beings to demonstrate who and what we really are and what we need to change. And there's all, I don't care how mature we are as Christians, there's something we need to change. There's something in our life that's not right. The Bible's not a popular book today. It's the best selling book in the world, but it's the worst read. The Bible isn't popular because it shows us warts and molds and all. You know, years ago before Dollywood, before all the things that were down in Sevierville, East Tennessee, some mountain folk lived down there. And some city folks decided they were going to take a weekend trip and they went down and camped in the mountains. And so old mountaineer was watching them and he waited when they left. And it was unusual to see vacationers in those days. And he walked down to the campsite and looked around and see what they left behind. One of the things they dropped was a mirror. He picked up the mirror. He'd never seen one before. And he looked at it and he said, I never knew Pappy had his picture done. And he took that mirror home with him and he sneaked it in the house and went up in the loft and hid it. His wife saw him. And so when he went out to do some work, she went up in the loft and she searched and she found that mirror. And she looked at it and he said, she said, Oh, so that's the hag he's been running around with. <laughs> you see, people find different things in the Bible and they always seem to see someone else. You need to look at the Bible reflects who you are. It's so easy to think the Bible is talking about your next door neighbor or someone else, but it's not. Let me tell you something. It's a picture of you. It's a picture of me. And it shows us warts and all. Now, the design of the word, verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue with that man, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Looketh means to look attentively or penetratingly at something. And when he talks about the perfect law of liberty, he's, James isn't talking about the Mosaic law here. He's talking about the law of grace. James isn't talking about the same the law in the same sense that the Apostle Paul talked about it. Paul usually when he's talking about the law, talks about the Mosaic law. James talks about the law, he's talking about the law of faith. You know, there's love in the law of the Old Testament, and there's law in the love of the New Testament. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's love. However, the Lord also said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And Paul said, Bear you one another's burden so that you fulfill the law of Christ. That's law. What law? Christ's law. That's what we need to be now. We need to look into the perfect law of liberty. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. No, again, action's required. And if you're driving down the highway, it's going to be crowded with traffic. Oh, to go back to the days when you didn't see a lot of cars, but now they're everywhere. But it's also loaded with laws out there. And that's why you see the unparked police cars, they're going to enforce those laws. If you want to have freedom to drive down that highway, you better obey the laws. There's liberty in Christ, and that is the only true freedom. You know, people talk about being free. People talk, you want freedom. Freedom's only found in Jesus Christ. And you can be sure, if you're in Christ, you're going to obey Him. And His laws are not hard. They're not rigorous. His laws are love. Because you're a child of God, your freedom does not entitle you to break the Ten Commandments. What? Now, just because you believe it doesn't give you the freedom to break the law. To sin against God. But you have to remember, those laws in the Old Testament were given for the weak. 
They were given for the natural man. Laws are for the lawbreakers. What to do, where to go, and how, and they contain punishments for those who break them. Honest citizens don't need the law. And you always heard the old saying, locks are not for honest people. You can leave, if everybody was honest, you can leave your door open. You know, I don't know half of the laws in the state of Virginia. But that shyster lawyer knows them all. Why? Because he wants to break them. He wants to find a loophole that he can use. You know, but today, God calls his children to a higher level. You know, we're, we are, we're at a higher level. You know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, if you look after a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He just raised the standard. That fella cuts you off in traffic and you, well, I wish you, I wish you were dead. You just murdered that man. The standard has been raised. We're called to a higher level. A believer has spiritual alertness. He has a high and lofty motive and inspiration of God. The believer has no desire to murder. He's not going to break the law. The believer's motivation is love for the Savior and his desire to obey the Lord. Now, the absolute truth is the more that we read and study the Bible, the more we'll learn, the more we'll love, the more we'll live, the more joy will fill our hearts and flood our soul simply by reading and studying the Word of God. You know, we're not like galley slaves whipped and chained and onto a bench and doing things we don't want to do. You know, we don't need to know all the laws of our state or the country, but we need to know the Word of God if we are to live for Him. The higher call is to live for God. I don't agree with the old song that says, you don't need to understand, you just need to hold his hand. You know what? I don't agree with that. Brothers and sisters, you need to understand. You need the Word of God. There are too many people today who ignore the Word of God. But you know, we can be ignorant about things. But you know, there's no disgrace to be ignorant. I don't know about you, but I was born ignorant. I didn't know my A from B. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't walk. But I didn't stay that way. You know, I was in bad shape. But you know what? You can cure ignorance. It's no disgrace in being ignorant. It's a disgrace to stay ignorant if you're a child of God. That's why we're told, be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only. We need to hear the Word, put the Word into action in our life. Because God says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now was a day of salvation. Today, if you will hear my voice, it's time to quit the passive tense and get back to the imperative of God's Word, action. If you're not a believer, the only thing He asks for is to believe, to come. Jesus Christ died for you too. You know what some people don't realize? If only one person in the last 2,000 years would come to Jesus Christ for salvation, He would still go to that cross for that one person. And He went there for you and me. But the old Southern Gospel song, Christ was on the cross, you were on His mind. He wants you to come. Sometimes we have other problems, other worries. You know, put your, put your worries and cares on the Lord. Read your Bible. Be doers of the Word. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, as we close this morning, I'm offering an invitation this morning to any who may not be saved that are here this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit is working in those lives right now. Not to put it off. Even if they're just unsure, maybe they're not sure of their salvation, well, this would be the time. Today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, you say. And your word is truth. Maybe there are other problems, family problems, health problems. Maybe there's just a need to be a better doer of the Word. I pray that right now they're dealing with you. Father, help us all to be doers of the Word and not fall in the danger of not doing what you want us to do. 
Help us to understand that we are the doer version of Scripture and that people are watching us day after day how we live for you or how we don't. Help us to make the best version possible, Lord, starting right this moment and moving forward. I ask that you have your way in every heart. For I do pray in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. All right. Thank you for being with us this morning. I hope the Lord worked in your life some.